Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to tune in to one of the virtual seminars that we have here at the Almond Conference this year. Uh, my topic today is going to be optimizing decision making through in-block sensing. My name is Anthony Mel. I'm a research agronomist here with Semios and uh, very eager to share with you today some of the new tools and products that we have uh, regarding irrigation management. So what data can you use to inform irrigation decisions? Well, to answer this question, we need to first consider what are the conventional approaches to irrigation scheduling that are currently available to us? These conventional approaches can be categorized into balance-based, soil-based, and plant-based techniques. Now, each one of these techniques can be improved by utilizing in-block sensors. For the balance-based uh, approach, you'd be using weather uh, sensors that measure climatic variables. For a soil-based approach, you'll be looking at soil moisture probes that measure uh, volumetric water content or plant available water. And with the plant-based approach, you'll be measuring some form of crop water status, whether directly or indirectly. And while each one of these techniques can improve your irrigation management, uh, it should be noted that having all these data points layered together can help you make the most informed decisions. Now, when it comes to weather-based decision making, we're really trying to strike a balance between the inputs and outputs of water on the farm. And the inputs, of course, are precipitation or irrigation water applied, and the outputs would be evapotranspiration and crop use combined, also known as evapotranspiration or ET. Now, you can measure actual ET uh, using a weighing lysimeter, but this is a very costly piece of equipment, and while it's been indispensable to the research community, uh, it's not really a viable solution to measuring ET on a commercial scale. So instead what we do is we model it. And we do this by placing a weather station on a well-watered grass reference crop. Now the weather station will measure different climatic variables such as radiation, temperature, wind speed, humidity, and others. And uh, these variables are put into the Penman-Monteith equation that you see at the bottom of your screen here. And what this provides us with is potential evapotranspiration or ETO. We then take this and modify or multiply it by a specific crop factor or KC value, and this then provides us with evapotranspiration and crop use per day, either in inches or millimeters. California has a great resource of reference ET data provided by the uh, network of Simis weather stations. Now, many growers are likely using monthly average uh, reference ET data uh, based on the zone or specific region that they're located. Uh, still, others may take the added step of downloading ET data from a proximate Simis uh, weather station. And while this is a great resource for farmers in the state, um, it does have some drawbacks. Uh, for one, using uh, monthly average historical data can show a lot of variance, especially from one year to the next. Furthermore, the nearest active Simis weather station can result in uh, measurable differences in some of the climatic variables. Uh, as you can see in the map here, uh, there's an increasing density of Semios customer in-block weather stations compared to Simis stations. Now the benefit of having all of these in-block weather stations is that we can now model and generate site-specific ET. Um, now the value of this is that uh, whereas you would normally only have one singular ET value or ETC value for the week or for the day for your entire property, uh, we can now provide you with adjusted ETC values for each block or irrigation set that you choose to configure. So in addition to providing site-specific uh, ET data, we can also generate these spatial crop water requirement maps, such as the one as you see in the image here. Now each one of these dots, dots on the map is uh, represented by a, a mating disruption pheromone aerosol dispenser. Now in, a, in addition to dispensing pheromones, each one of these units also measures uh, temperature as well as relative humidity. And it's with these uh, you know, high density sensors on a per block basis that allows us to create these types of visuals and uh, develop some perspectives that we wouldn't have uh, otherwise. The map that I've generated here uh, is looking at an entire growing season's worth of crop water demands for several almond blocks. And you can see in some cases that there is a a large difference um, in certain clustered areas, in some cases anywhere from two to three inches in uh, differences in water demand. And so being able to step back and look at this entire season's worth of crop water demands 
uh, on within a block and for all your blocks on your property it starts to develop some incentive as well as some guidance on how to de develop maybe a variable rate irrigation program. Now thus far I've only discussed how we measure and model outputs of water on the farm and of course that's only one side of the water balance so now I'd like to take some time to discuss some of the sensors that we use to measure the inputs of water on the farm. Our weather stations are equipped with rain buckets that record precipitation data and provides it to the grower in real time. Irrigation is measured by placing sensors on lateral lines to determine on-off uh, times. These on-off times can then be used to determine volume applied. But these inline sensors provide an increased amount of traceability on the farm. Uh, growers are able to validate if their plans were executed. And furthermore, they can use these sensors to identify deviations and possible issues in the, in the field without actually having to be there during an irrigation event. Monitoring irrigation activity is quite simple with the Semios Live app. In the map on the left, you'll see a bird's eye view of a grower's entire property. Uh, each of the highlighted blocks represents an individual irrigation set that is run independently of one another. Each one of the drop icons denotes where in that particular block the sensor is located. And the green lines in the table on the right indicate uh, precise on-off times for each individual set while the column on the right provides you with the total runtime for each irrigation set for that particular week. Alright, well so far I've only really discussed the weather-based uh, decision approach to irrigation scheduling and as you can see there's a lot of incoming data points and it can get complicated really fast. So what we've done is we've designed the irrigation planner tool which integrates all these incoming data points into one singular platform. And so what you have here is your daily weather forecast you have your daily crop water requirement, you have your daily precipitation recorded, and you have your inline sensors that are calculating your irrigation volume applied. And so this results in a fully automated water balance tool that you can track in real time. The automated water balance feature is just one aspect of the irrigation planner, and as the name suggests, you can actually plan and schedule your future irrigation events. Once you've developed your upcoming irrigation schedule for the week, uh, you can actually share your irrigation plan with the click of a button uh, with your foreman or irrigator. And again, this goes back to increasing the amount of accountability and traceability on the farm that just really is impossible without any type of remote sensing. Alright, so with that I'd like to move on to a discussion of soil-based approaches to irrigation scheduling. Now whether you're using your hands to assess soil moisture or you actually have probes in the ground connected to data loggers, there's a lot of room for error when it comes to interpreting soil moisture data. A lot of the commercially available and reliable probes on the market provide soil moisture data in terms of volumetric water content. Now the problem with volumetric water content or VWC has to do with soil type and specifically soil texture. For example, a soil with a very sandy soil type with a VWC of 20% will not have the same available water content as a heavy clay soil with a VWC of 20%. And when we consider just how variable soil type can be at different locations and at depths, it can get really complicated in terms of trying to use VWC as an actionable decision point for triggering irrigation. So at Semios, we've converted our soil moisture probe data from volumetric water content into available water content based on the principles of saturation, field capacity, and permanent wilting point. We've developed an algorithm to detect field capacity rather than use a generic calibration procedure to estimate volumetric water content. And so ultimately, what we provide the grower with is available water content, which is a normalized value between 0 and 100%. And after all, what we truly care about is what is available to the plant. So before moving on to a review of our soil moisture probe data, uh, let's first define some of these properties of available water content. Saturation refers to a point where all the soil pores are completely filled and water flows freely as a result of gravity. Uh, this could be deep percolation and or surface runoff. Field capacity refers to the maximum amount of soil moisture that a soil can hold at one point and uh, water is no longer moving freely from these pores. And finally, permanent wilting point refers to the point when plants can no longer extract water freely from the soil. 
All right, so here is a, an example of our soil moisture probe data on the Semios Live app. And as you can see, the uh, soil moisture information is presented in terms of available water content. And as you can see, the lateral lines shown here uh, represent available water content in terms of the three principles that we just discussed. Uh, that bottom red line being 0% uh, available water, also known as permanent wilting point. 100% uh, are the blue line being field capacity, and anything above 100% being a point of saturation. Now the third line that you see there is the green line, which is your managed allowable depletion line, also known as your MAD line. And this is essentially your trigger point for when you should start your irrigation event. And as you can see in the upper right hand corner, you can actually edit your MAD line in terms of percent of available water content. So the MAD line is a user defined feature that can be adjusted throughout the growing season. Uh, here we see it set at 70% of available water capacity. And here we see the MAD line drop down to 40%. And this may be applicable during, say, a period of dormancy and or perhaps during a period of uh, regulated deficit irrigation control. So you'll see in this example that there are several lines and each one represents a particular depth for the soil moisture probe. And while having several depths at once displayed on your graph can provide a lot of insight into how the soil moisture is moving throughout your soil profile, it can get pretty complicated when it comes to determining uh, when to irrigate. And so we've simplified things by allowing you to average the selected depths of interest. And this provides you with just a singular line. And uh, all you need to do really is maintain that line between your FC and MAD thresholds. Using the incoming probe data on the user interface uh, to maintain soil moisture between FC and MAD lines is a fairly straightforward process. But how can we use all of this incoming data to improve uh, future scheduling of irrigation events? We're leveraging all of our incoming data to create a model at the sensor level. We begin by capturing the current soil moisture status at the point when irrigation is first triggered. We then monitor how the soil moisture is refilled and then depleted over a set period of time. We then take this ingested data to develop a predictive model and this model can actually simulate uh, how soil moisture is affected based on different irrigation run times that are planned and scheduled. This soil moisture prediction tool will continue to improve over time as the model identifies certain areas of the simulated forecast that either overestimate or underestimate uh, soil moisture uh, based on the actual results that the probe reads. Now the idea here is to have the soil moisture prediction model embedded into the irrigation planner tool. The grower can then plan out their irrigation schedule and input values either in inches or hours per day and they can actually visualize and see the differences in soil moisture uh, in the graph down at the bottom. Being able to simulate and visualize the effects of future irrigation events on soil moisture uh, is a very powerful tool that will keep the grower one step ahead in terms of management decisions. Right, so with that I'd like to move on to a discussion of the plant-based approach to irrigation scheduling. So with the plant-based approach, we're trying to measure uh, crop water status in some way. And we use these measures of crop water status as a signal for when we should next irrigate. Now, this approach is best used in conjunction with soil-based as well as weather-based approaches because while it can tell you when to irrigate, it doesn't necessarily tell you how much to irrigate. When it comes to measuring crop water status, we can either do this directly or indirectly. Using a pressure chamber or a pressure bomb to measure stem water potential uh, would be an example of a, a direct based approach to measuring crop water status. While the pressure chamber is a proven and uh, well documented technique, uh, it's a very labor intensive process and uh, furthermore it requires a developed skill set to avoid any kind of operator error. But now we're seeing some new sensors uh, emerge onto the market that still provide that direct stem water potential reading but in a fully automated fashion. Still, there are other uh, automated sensors on the market, um, and while they don't measure uh, water potential directly, we can still use them to estimate crop water status pretty efficiently. In the image on the far right, you'll see we have a trunk dendrometer sensor that's installed. And the trunk dendrometer measures a uh, trunk diameter, and it's able to capture uh, the diurnal fluctuations of the tree and um, ex exhibit any changes in the trunk diameter. 
So we're using those trunk dendrometers that I showed you in the previous slide uh, to measure the expansion and contraction of the trunk diameter. We can then take this data to generate daily values of crop water stress. Now a lower daily recorded value uh, represents an unstressed condition, whereas a higher value is going to represent uh, a higher water stress. Now the numbers may seem a bit arbitrary to a grower, uh, so instead what we've done is we've color-coded them based on the level of stress recorded. Now this particular example here uh, really demonstrates how one in-block sensor uh, is re related to another. You can see in the circled region on the left there, uh, the soil moisture profile has fallen below the managed allowable depletion for several days in a row. And as a result, um, the water stress indicators from the trunk dendrometer have uh, continued to increase. And then you can see in the circled region on the right, that it took several days of the soil moisture profile being refilled above the MAD line uh, until those plant health indicators uh, went back to a low stress uh, scenario. And these uh, plant health indicators that are provided daily will also be integrated into the irrigation planner view on the Semios Live app. Now having them all here in one view really allows you to see how your weather-based and soil-based approaches to irrigation scheduling are having an effect on your plant water stress. And again, that's one of the greatest advantages of this irrigation planner. You can take all these disparate sets of data and integrate them into one singular management tool. And as we've seen, each one of these in-block sensors uh, provides a unique and important uh, set of data to the irrigation planner. We have our weather stations, which provide necessary climatic variables. We have our in-block sensors that provide us with daily crop water requirement values. We have our inline sensors, which monitor on-off irrigation times, as well as volume applied. You have your soil moisture probes, which tells you just how much plant available water is remaining in your soil profile. And we have our plant-based sensors, which provide us with a measure of crop water stress. All right, so let's do a quick recap of what we've discussed here today. So I provided a review of the weather-based, soil-based, and plant-based approaches to irrigation scheduling and demonstrated in multiple cases how Semios in-block orchard sensors can improve both the precision and accuracy of each approach. And we showed how having multiple data points layered into one irrigation planner allows for easy cross-referencing of multiple water status indicators. We saw how this level of granular insight can help you evaluate the impact of your irrigation plan. We looked at how Semios can provide the ability to monitor uh, the execution of your irrigation plan. And finally, we looked at how Semios can provide a singular platform to help make the most well-informed decision when it comes to irrigation scheduling. And this platform not only allows for remote control and sensing, but it also enables the user to uh, adopt and implement future automation. So that completes the presentation that I have for you today. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen in, and I look forward to answering any and all questions that you might have. Um, and with that, uh, enjoy the rest of your 2020 Almond Conference. Thank you.